In September 1947, Eleonora, Eleonora Darenkowska, uh, an Ukrainian-born Jewish dancer, choreographer, poet, photographer, filmmaker, and pioneer of American avant-garde cinema, commonly known as Maya Doren, arrived in Haiti to complete her film project on ritual dances and songs. At that point, on the first of her four trips there, she had a very, very clear aesthetic concept of, for shooting and recording voodoo ceremonies. Since the voodoo religion is a mythology, she claimed, its manifestation in ritual can be only represented through, I quote, poetic texture. The poetic form was for her a way to avoid the symbolic violence of Western ethnography, which she fully rejected. Once Deren recognized the social reality of Haiti, which was a misery, and the function of ritual practices as a commentary thereon, she realized that her creative project had to integrate a realistic level into the poetic one in order to reflect the fundamental relationship of equal equivalence between the realms of religion and social life. So, during her next stay in Haiti in 1949, Darren still described her film project as a polyphonic fugue of voices, it was a quote, she already knew that to make a film about voodoo was to produce images of the invisible. Since voodoo practice was a religious underground, suppressed both by the government and the Catholic clergy, it was almost impossible to get photographic or cinematic evidence of an authentic, let's say, non-touristic ceremony. This recognition compelled Deren to integrate herself into the local community who took part in the ritual to herself attend to underground ceremonies and ultimately become initiated in the voodoo praxis. At that moment, Haiti became, I quote, a rite so the Haiti became a rite through which she passes as an artist, end of quote, as well as an individual. Through the bodily experience of the ritual, Maya Deren, disconnected from her Eastern European Jewish diaspora by the violent history of the anti-Semitic programs in the Ukraine, refound and or reinvented herself as an, I quote, accepted member of the Haitian community of believers. This so she described herself like an acceptant member of a uh, Haitian community of believers. Bringing different identities and cultural patterns, lived experience uh, and memory into dynamic relation, Deren's initiation into voodoo practice turned out to be a reactivation of the past towards, toward, towards a changed future. It's also a quote by Deren. This process can be called an affective transition, which, following Brian Masumi, I understand as a passing through in body from one state of capacitation to another in the context of the dynamic unity of an event. In Politics of Affects, Masumi states, I quote, when you affect, affect something, you are at the same time opening yourself to being affected in turn, and in a slightly different way than you might have been um, the moment before. You have stepped over a threshold. Affect is, is, is this passing of a threshold seen from the point of view of the change in capacity." End of quote. Therefore, affect can be recognized as an invisible force mediating relations between the individual and the collective, connecting bodily capacitation with extrapersonal <coughs> experience. In her 1953 study, Divine Horseman, The Living Gods of Haiti, Maya Duran problematizes the inconsistency between the visible and the invisible, not only as a political issue, but also as a crucial aesthetic one, exploring the ritual and its um, sacred <coughs> dances as, I quote, communal ceremonies, which on the visible level seem, I quote, like anarchic and inhibited dancing, end of quote. And then we quote again from here. The dances and the ritual itself, that which is visible, has meaning only within the context of the metaphysics which is invisible. End of quote.
the tension between the visible and the invisible is negotiated in the ritual by the spirits of the law, also known as les invisibles, les <coughs> the invisible. They appear in the trance-like state of possession of one or more participants uh, and are visibly transmitted through their moving bodies. It is said that the law are mounting the, their horses. This image of a possessed human body became a crucial one for Maya Deren as an artist because it problematized the transformative power of aesthetic confrontation with the undocumentable. I quote, it is a matter of the law or the principles being non-material and having no physical existence. Therefore, to become manifest, they have to put on the flesh of a body. That's a, a different dis distinction. End of quote. Once she noticed that the invisible manifests itself in the flesh of the ritual's participants, she realized that it can remain only in a bodily form and can be transmitted solely through the aesthetic infected by the body. Therefore, Maya Deren started to develop a new ritualistic film form which could convey in the juxtaposition of image and sound the context of the bodily experience of metaphysics and the communal impact of the ritual. Although she never finished the film she had planned of the course of eight years spanning her experience with Haiti, Deren created a heterogeneous body of work including 8,000 feet of footage, a huge collection of sounds, a photography series of Haitian, on Haitian life, a music album titled Voices of Haiti, and the anthropological study Divine Horseman, as well as a cut of edited fragments prepared for television, and a number of interviews and lectures she gave over several years after her return to New York in 1955. As she redirected her efforts, moving away from making a film towards a performative presentation of her Haitian experience, one of a fragmentary nature reflecting the laboratory essence of her project, Deren demonstrated the impossibility of editing what remained of the ritual into a cohesive film about voodoo ceremonies. In this way, she took an important step towards rejecting the Western paradigm of effectiveness, what I would like to tell more about. Maya Duran's unfinished work in progress film project aptly problematized the documentation of the undocumentable and its status in history writing, which is something I would like to discuss in my paper today. First, I would like to investigate the political potential of performance, building up my argument on the voodoo ceremony being a model for, for performative history writing. Second, I wish to explore the dialectical relationship between the crisis of visuality and the communal power of performativity. Third, I want to critically analyze the concept of the symbolic efficacy of a ritual as a cultural performance in order to develop the idea of historical agency based on the transformative power of remains. My goal is not only to demonstrate the impact of corporality, vocal materiality and gesture on the writing of history and the practice of politics, but also to emphasize the potentiality of bodily leftovers of an event in creating non identitarian forms of commonality, which I call an affective communitas. Searching for a ritualistic film form, Maya Duran was likely inspired by the significance of orator in Haitian culture, which is to be understood as a practice having, I quote, the quality of fluid blurring of the borders of conversation, storytelling, song, drama, and performance, end of quote, as well as a performative form of preserving history. It is the Haitian oral tradition, we can say orator, um, also that convinces us of the political impact of the voodoo ritual as it retells and reenacts the story of revolutionary implications of the famous Bois Caiman ceremony that took place one night in August 1791. 
Unlike Catholicism, which was the official religion of the colonizers and the mulatto Haitian elite, voodoo, being the religion of the people and the black peasant cult, was persecuted in Haiti at that time, at the time of the revolution. Um, despite the efforts of the French uh, to completely er eradicate this autonomous remnant of African culture, so important to the slaves, voodoo survived among the Haitian people as a religion of creation and life. As an active, vital and spiritual force, it was an important factor in the expression of the value of one's own existence and the celebration of people free from social, class and ethnic differences being together. Before the revolution, before the Haitian Revolution, this ritual therefore served to provide both psychological and existential succor functioning as an escapism for plantation slaves and as a political creed essential for the survival of the Maroons, so groups of runaway slaves who, acting as an insurrectionary movement, significantly influenced the history of Haiti and who, by 1791, had transmitted voodoo to the masses. Some researchers stress that, I quote, what 18th century colonists called voodoo may have been in reality a multiplicity of ethnic or locally based cults, in the plural, that expressed divergent rather than common identities and only later became integrated, end of quote. However, on the eve of the revolution, the voodoo ritual was a factor so temporal factor also of consolidating on an ideological and affective level the ethnically and linguistically diverse black community of Haiti. From that perspective, the Haitian Revolution was not a simple repetition of the French Revolution, but an outcome of politically and uh, religiously organized black resistance. In Hegel, Haiti and Universal History, Susan McMorris shows us the limitation of Western political philosophy, which, pretending to be a universal one, represses cultural differences. She historicizes Hegel's, Hegel's uh, master-slave dialectic in order to reveal in the Enlightenment idea of freedom the real experience of slavery. She also proposes the need to overcome the rational attitude to history and to extend what I really like, historical imagination. Inspired by this perspective, I propose to treat voodoo as a powerful force active throughout history and to talk about its transformative impact in terms of the agency of remains, since this ritual can be recognized neither as an expression of a homogeneous religion nor, a, nor as a basis for a historical continuity of any specifically defined community or, or culture. Highlighting this aspect in partic is particularly important in relation to subjugated groups or subalterns as it follows, uh, as, into, sorry, <laughs> as it uh, allows for the reconstruction of the misjudged, unrecognized and often repressed historical agency. In this particular case, it makes it possible to identify black slaves as agents of history. Historiography, which demands traditional um, documentation to identify, prove, uh, and establish facts and to confirm, uh, confirm the reliability of evidence, fails in confrontation with the ephemeral and the invisible, treating it, it as undocumentable and therefore non archivable. From the perspective of Western political history, alternative archives related to the repertoire of bodily forms of action and remembrance seem, if not worthless, certainly less than sufficient. This is not the case with anthropology, where it is primarily the sphere of ritualistic actions, rites, oral tradition, dance, art, magic, that constitutes a manifestation of a given culture, its history, and its existing social structures. Emphasizing that rituals not only communicate religious ideas, but are, I quote, taken by those performing them to be doing something, end of quote, anthropology recognized efficacy as a fundamental feature of the ritual. 
the focus on creating a certain effect on reality through symbolic actions allows us to interpret the ritual as a performance, of course, from the Western perspective, and the same time uh, as an embodied form of memory, based on the repetition of cultural patterns, convictions, beliefs and behaviours. Performance studies have turned this recognition into a kind of methodological tool allowing for comparative research of various cultures, but at the same time eliminating the historical conditions. John McKenzie claims that the challenge of efficacy formed the paradigm of performance studies, its interdisciplinary origins, its practical and theoretical models. Moreover, I quote, in theorizing performative efficacy, performance studies has mined the, its object of study, also in the gesture of institu institu institute. It's the morning, it's, <laughs> it's about time <laughs> to pronounce English, but you know what I mean, and established institutional research strategies and general models to theorize culture in, term, in terms of performative efficacy. In the historical development of the term performance in performance studies, we can observe a particular incongruence between the recognition of the stabil stabilizing function of the performance efficacy to renew or reaffirm existing structures on the one hand and of its transformative or resistant potential on the other. The notion of efficacy reveals the understanding of performance as a field of human activity, of course, based on symbolic forms and life bodies, and allowing for the manifestation, either affirmative or critical, if you want, or transformative, of a specific culture. Therefore, behind the concept of cultural performance based on the idea of social efficacy, there is an understanding of community which is connected to one, one distinguishable distinguishable culture or concrete society. I quote, uh, cultural performers are occasions in which a certain culture, a certain culture or society we reflect upon and define ourselves, we ourselves, dramatize, dramatize our collective myths and history, pre present ourselves with alternatives and eventually change in some ways while remaining in the same in others, end of quote. Efficacy assumes the existence of cultural continuity, allowing the community to manifest itself as a definable we grounded in myths, common history, religion, and in the dramatization and embodiment of symbolic forms. Before efficacy became a crucial methodological term in several theories on performativity, from G.A. Austin uh, through Richard Schechner to Philip Auslander, it was deeply explored by anthropologists as a fundamental feature of ritual in the context of crisis and community. Since the ritual is a series of symbolic actions in a certain community, it enables crisis to be confronted and eventually overcome. In his seminal text, the Effectiveness of Symbols, written in 1949, it was the same year when Maya Duren <laughs> uh, was on Haiti and also where she met Du Bois going to Moscow and through Warsaw. That's interesting. So, uh, this uh, trans, uh, trans uh, speciality and trans temporality uh, here, but we can discuss it later. I come back to Levi Strauss, of course, in his seminal text, The Effectiveness of Symbols, written in 1949, Claude Levi Strauss developed the concept of symbolic efficacy. So, I think he was the first using these both tests together. Comparing the social function of rituals and psychoanalysis. In particular, he examines shamanism as a model of overcoming individual crisis in order to achieve social consensus and psychological coherence in both the individual and the collective. Underlining the role of beliefs in non-Western healing processes and in Western therapies, Levi-Strauss believed he developed an objective model of symbolic efficacy, 
as an expression of the necessary connection between collective thoughts and individual psychology, as well as the process of structuring the body. Although Levi Strauss noticed the agency of bodily remains in the reenactment of past experiences, interpreting the healing ritual as a series of events observed by the body of a sick person, he reflected bodily processes through symbols and language in order to achieve a harmony between myth and operations. The idea of historical agency I propose is strictly connected to the ambiguity and not to the identity of the body and is based on the concept on an affective communitas. Referring to the definition formulated by Spinoza in which affect is the ability to affect and, being, and be affected, I ask if affect can become a proto-political element in encounters and events, how relationability itself can turn into transformative potential of being together, and how an affective communitas can be established as an immediately political one. To achieve this goal, it is necessary to overcome the limits of traditional disciplines of knowledge, like philosophy or historiography, in order to implement the concept of affective change. Brian Masumi points out that, I quote, the concept of affect is transversal, end of quote, meaning that it cuts across the usual categories, as the categories of the subjective and the objective, or individual and collective. This is why the transversality of affect manifests itself in the body. Since the body is both individual and collective, it has this capacity for affecting and being affected. The body itself can be seen as being always in transition, from affect to emotion, from movement to habit, from experience to memory, from presence to absence. The idea of historical agency, therefore, is realized through the establishment of but could be realized through the establishment of unstable forms of commonality, which do not refer to one culture or a certain culture and one common history, but rather to a fragmentary, eclectic, and spontaneously understood affective communitas. In my view, an affective communitas as a locally and ephemerally emerging bond among a powerless minority is deprived of the choice between confirming and changing cultural values. Its essence lies in the situational sense of being together, and at the same time it has the ability to influence political change through reviving past remains and future potential in the body. On the one hand, an affective communitas is orientated against a def definable and permanent identity as it recognizes in it a tool of control and domination over the other. On the other hand, it may appear in various distant time and space configurations, undermining the idea of linearly understood history as a basis for building collective identity, or what we call collective identity. An affective communitas, which I propose to treat as a temporal cross-cultural togetherness with transformative potential, is thus a key form of the manifestation of historical ages. And I skipped the example too. <laughs> <laughs> so.